Hey folks, with the release of Ice Crown Citadel, Blizzard has added a new level of difficulty to Titan Rune Dungeons in Wrath Classic. The official name for this is Titan Rune Gamma Dungeons, but most of the community just calls them Heroic Plus Dungeons, or H Plus for short. In this video, I'll go over everything that you need to know about the changes made to the affixes and rewards for the new Gamma Dungeons. That being said, Blizzard has made barely any changes to the existing affixes that were added back in Phase 3, which is something I've already covered in an extremely detailed guide. Since that video is still completely accurate for Titan Rune Gamma Dungeons, I won't be repeating that information here and will instead focus on the changes they've made. If you've never done a single Titan Rune Dungeon before in Wrath Classic, I'd recommend watching that video first, and you can find it linked in the description below. Additionally, if you'd like a refresher on the baseline mechanics for every single Heroic Dungeon, I've also linked a playlist with all of my Wrath Dungeon Guides in the video description, and it even includes the three new ICC Dungeons. With all of that out of the way, let's dive into the new Titan Rune Gamma Dungeons. The first thing I want to touch upon is technically not a change related to the Gamma Dungeons themselves, but rather the addition of the Random Dungeon Finder. Although this impacts all difficulties of dungeons, it also has an extremely large impact on the overall dynamic of Titan Rune Dungeons. Previously, in order to start one of these instances, you had to form a group by hand and then interact with a large Titan Rune within the dungeon in order to enable the hard mode. While you still technically can do this for Gamma Dungeons, there's absolutely no point. If you queue up for a Gamma Dungeon with the Random Dungeon Finder, the hard mode will already be enabled after you enter, so even pre-made groups have no reason to travel out to the dungeons. Additionally, this change means that dungeon lockouts are mostly a thing of the past, as you can endlessly queue for random dungeons even if you're locked out to every single one. That being said, you can only specific queue for each dungeon a single time per day, which makes it a little bit harder to grind non-stop for that one item you need. The most notable impact of this change, though, is the fact that it allows you to farm an infinite amount of Defiler Scourge Stones, which is a new type of special currency that you'll receive for completing Titan Rune Gamma Dungeons. This is the new version of Sidereal Essence, which was the currency you obtained by completing Titan Rune Beta Dungeons. However, unlike the previous currency, which was only dropped by end bosses, you'll be able to loot a single Defiler Scourge Stone from every dungeon boss you kill. The only exception to this is the final boss of the Oculus, which actually drops three Scourge Stones instead of the usual one. This makes the Oculus a ridiculously good dungeon to run if you're trying to buy catch-up gear, and trust me, it's not as scary as many people make it out to be. I've been running it every single day since the patch launched, and by following the strategies I outlined in my Oculus guide that I made when Wrath Classic launched, each run has been buttery smooth with zero wipes. As for how to actually spend your Scourge Stones, you can find the associated vendor in your faction's badge room within Dalaran. For Horde players, this NPC will be Kalara Dream Smasher, and Alliance players will speak to Coraline Hope Render. These vendors sell a ton of useful catch-up gear from Hard Mode 25 Man Ultimar and Normal 25 Man TOGC. Additionally, you can exchange your Scourge Stones for Primordial Serenite, Trophy of the Crusade, and the old currency, Sidereal Essence. While the uses for Primordial Serenite and the Trophy should be self-explanatory, downgrading into Sidereal Essence is actually a much more lucrative option than many people may initially realize. Since the conversion rate is 1 to 1, and Scourge Stones are much easier to farm than Sidereal Essence, you're able to purchase some super cheap items from the old animated Constellation vendor. Now, you might be wondering why buying older gear would be a good option, but it actually makes a lot more sense when you compare the item levels. For instance, let's say I wanted to buy a one-handed agility weapon, and I was considering purchasing Blood Fury with 50 Defiler Scourge Stones. This weapon is 245 item level, which is good. However, if we go over to the old vendor, you'll notice that Serolos and Void Saber are also 245 agility one-handers. The key difference is that these two weapons only cost 25 Sidereal Essence, which translates into 25 Scourge Stones, making them half the price of Blood Fury. You'll be able to find similar cases present for most weapon types, which means this conversion is something almost everyone should consider. That isn't to say that the items from the Scourge Stone vendor aren't good, as many of them are extremely powerful. I just wanted to show that you shouldn't write off the Sidereal Essence items even if they aren't quote-unquote new. The last thing worth noting about the reward structure is the changes made to the actual drops within dungeons, or rather, the lack of changes. Unlike the previous set of Titan Rune Dungeons, which added 10-man Noxramus and 10-man Ulduar gear to the loot tables, respectively, nothing has changed with Titan Rune Gamma Dungeons. Honestly, I think this is a pretty big mistake on Blizzard's part, as it makes 10-man TOGC gear arbitrarily more difficult to obtain compared to every other raid. 
I personally hope that Blizzard changes their minds in this in the future, but at the time of recording, the in-dungeon loot tables are completely identical to what they were in Titan Rune Beta Dungeons. Additionally, the new dungeons are still rewarding Emblems of Triumph, which means that Emblems of Frost will remain a fairly scarce resource early on. Now that we've discussed all the changes to the reward structure, we can take a look at the mechanical changes present in Titan Rune Gamma Dungeons. At the start of the video, I mentioned that the affixes themselves have received next to no changes, and while this is true for the mechanical aspect, Blizzard has, of course, increased the scaling modifiers. Mobs will now deal 70% increased damage, up from 40%, and their health modifier has gone up to 215% in most dungeons, with some of them being even higher. That may seem like a lot, but to counterbalance things, Blizzard has added a new positive buff, which is present in every single Gamma dungeon. The best thing about this buff is that you actually have four options to choose from, so it'll be valuable for every member of your group. You'll be able to select which buff you want by speaking to the Sunreaver or Silver Covenant Warden NPC, who can be found at the start of every Gamma dungeon. If you forgot to select your buff or you change your mind midway, you'll be able to use an item called Signet of the Sunreaver or Silver Covenant for Alliance, which resummons the buff NPC to your location within the dungeon. The item will automatically appear within your bags after you enter an instance, and it has an infinite number of uses. As for the buffs themselves, here are your four options. Shield of Thorns is easily the most overpowered buff. However, this is only when it's in the hands of a tank. The effect causes you to deal roughly 2,400 damage whenever you dodge, parry, or block. As you might imagine, this means it's ludicrously broken on protection paladins and warriors, as they get tons of blocks, which translates into a massive amount of damage. With this buff, it's not uncommon for protection tanks to be the top AoE DPS in your group by a large margin. While Bear Druids and Blood Death Knights will get slightly less value out of this buff, it's still their strongest option by far. The next buff, Rallying Cry of the Tournament Champion, is what all of your ranged DPS and healers should be running. This causes spell or range damage and critical strikes to grant 20% haste to your party for 10 seconds, which is effectively a mini bloodlust that occurs quite often. While this effect can also be procced by melee DPS who cast spells, such as rep paladins, you should only consider this if your entire group consists of melee DPS. As long as the healer is running this and you have at least one caster DPS, your uptime on the haste buff should be more than sufficient. For melee DPS, you'll get a buff called Shatter Defenses, and it causes your melee attacks to sometimes apply a debuff to enemy targets, which increases their damage taken by 20% for 10 seconds. Obviously, this effect is really powerful, and it's the only one that melee DPS can really benefit from, so they should be running it at all times. I have heard a few tanks say they're considering running this buff over the Thorns one, but I wouldn't recommend that. On any multi-target pulls, your personal damage contribution from the Thorns will always outweigh the damage increase provided by the debuff. The only exception to this would be in a pure single target fight if you're in a group with zero melee DPS. In a full caster group, it may be worth it for Druids and Death Knights to run this buff in AoE settings, but I'm still not sure it would actually outperform the Thorns. Finally, Confessor's Wrath is aimed purely at healers, but the current design is absolute garbage. The effect grants you a stacking 20% damage buff when you use a direct healing spell, and it caps out at 5 stacks. This may sound pretty good, except for the fact that the buff fades after you use a single damaging ability, and it can't be procced again for 30 seconds. Honestly, this buff is so poorly designed that I feel it needs a complete rework. It's clearly intended to provide a damage bonus to healers after they finish topping everyone off, but the buff is extremely lackluster and goes away too quickly for you to actually take advantage of it. As a healer, you're far better off running Rallying Cry of the Tournament Champion or Shatter Defenses, as you can try to help proc either effect whenever the group doesn't need healing. This will result in a far larger damage contribution to your group compared to a 100% buff on a single spell. If you're a healer that doesn't like dealing damage and only presses healing buttons, then unfortunately none of the four buffs have anything to offer you, which I feel is a pretty big oversight on Blizzard's end. In the future, I hope that Blizzard hotfixes Confessor's Wrath to provide some sort of increase to healing abilities, but for now, it's just an undertuned buff that nobody should run. While those buffs are the only new mechanical additions to Titan Rune Gamma Dungeons, I want to take a moment to discuss some additional tips that I have for each of the dungeons which weren't covered in my original guide for Titan Rune Beta. 
For starters, let's touch upon the three Ice Crown Citadel dungeons, as I wasn't entirely sure where to discuss them within this video. Unlike every single other dungeon, which has the aforementioned scaling modifiers, bonus affixes, and Sun Reaver buff NPC, the ICC dungeons have nothing. These three instances are completely identical to their original versions in vanilla Wrath of the Lich King, except for the fact that all of the bosses will drop Defiler Scourge Stones in addition to their standard loot. While you can encounter these dungeons in the pool for Titan Rune Gamma, they'll play out exactly like a regular heroic. Now, Blizzard claimed the reason they weren't adding any affixes to these dungeons is because they were already somewhat challenging, but the irony is that now all three ICC dungeons are largely considered to be the easiest ones to clear. Generally speaking, anyone looking to complete their heroic dungeon daily should specifically queue for Forge of Souls, as it's extremely fast and easy to complete with a geared group. Before I discuss the tips I have for certain dungeons, I wanted to establish that I have absolutely nothing else to say about the following instances. Calling of Stratholm, Drak Theron Keep, Utgard Keep, Utgard Pinnacle, Violet Hold, The Nexus, On Gehet the Old Kingdom, and Halls of Lightning. I haven't discovered any new tips for these dungeons that weren't already covered in my previous guide, and none of them received any additional hotfixes. Moving on to Gundrak, my tip specifically involves when you encounter it while using the random dungeon finder. Gundrak has two different entrances, and the Dungeon Finder will always start you on the one closest to Murabi. In my Gundrak guide, I recommended that you start on the side near Sladron, as the pathing is a bit more straightforward, and doing this allows you to skip a decent amount of trash. Unfortunately, there's no way to change your entrance point after starting the dungeon in LFG, so I'll quickly review the optimal routing from this side of the dungeon. After defeating Murabi, backtrack through the door that opens the wall and defeat X. Once you've killed this boss, you can swim through some hidden underwater tunnels all the way over to Drakari Colossus. You'll pull this boss and defeat him like normal, but after killing him, there's unfortunately no shortcut that allows you to directly reach Sladra. You'll just need to get to him the old-fashioned way by turning left and clearing out the room of trash blocking your path. Once Sladron has been defeated, you can jump into the water once again and swim back to the center in order to challenge Galdara. Next up, for Halls of Stone, I have an extremely minor tip that I recently discovered thanks to random people in my Dungeon Finder group. When fighting the Maiden of Grief, you can actually drag her really far outside of the boss room, and this allows you to easily carry over your titanic power stacks into the next hole. My tip for Trial of the Champion is similarly minor, but it involves an actual change made by Blizzard. Previously, the affix would cause debris to be thrown around the arena for most of the dungeon, but they've decided to dial this back ever so slightly. In the current version, the obstacles won't begin spawning until you enter boss combat, and they'll despawn the moment the boss is dead. This means the trash before Eatric or Palatris will be much easier to deal with, and you won't have quite as difficult of a time getting into a good position before you pull a boss. The only downside to this is that you won't be able to pick up the Berserker buffs before starting a boss fight, which means your initial burst damage won't be quite as high. The Oculus got a pretty notable change, as the Azur Whelps in the first section of the dungeon can no longer spawn mirror images. In my previous video, I mentioned that this was one of the only bad overlaps you could encounter with the Arcane Rune, so I think this is a good change that makes the Oculus even easier than it already was. Also, while it's completely unrelated to Titan Rune dungeons, I wanted to share a pretty cool strategy I discovered for Mage Lord Aram. If the tank breaks line of sight with the boss while he's casting Frost Bomb, the ability actually just won't go off. This means you can tank a ROM in a stationary position next to a pillar and have the tank quickly duck out of line of sight before every single cast. Honestly, the timing on this is pretty tight and the fight is already fairly easy, so this strategy isn't actually very impactful. That being said, I always have a lot of fun trying to pull it off, so I wanted to at least share it somewhere. Finally, Asgill Nerub received some much-needed hotfixes over the last few months to address a few broken interactions with the Shadow Room. For starters, getting web-wrapped no longer removes your threat, so if a tank gets wrapped, it's unlikely that a melee DPS will immediately be whacked in the face. Honestly, I'm still a bit salty that nothing else has changed with the Shadow Rune's targeting, as it remains the most annoying affix to deal with by far. The web wrap not dropping your threat is a good start, but it still means tanks will be taking a ton of damage with no ability to mitigate it until their party members break them out. In addition to this, certain trash mobs in the areas around Hadronox will no longer web wrap players. The most notable ones are the Skittering Swarmers which can be found around the tunnel that you jump into after killing Hadronox. In my last video, I mentioned that these Swarmers had a high chance of killing off a party member by causing them to be web-wrapped in mid-air. After this change, you can safely jump into the hole without worrying about getting killed. Lastly, the infinitely spawning trash mobs during the Hadronox Gauntlet will no longer cause players to be web-wrapped, but functionally this doesn't change a lot. 
you'll still want to avoid pulling Hadronox until all of the adds are dead, and the boss himself still has a chance of wrapping a player if he's attacking the adds. These changes are pretty solid overall, but Blizzard still needs to put in a lot of work if they don't want Astral Nerub and the Old Kingdom to feel terrible. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know about the Titan Rune Gamma Dungeons in Wrath of the Lich King Classic. If you want to learn more about the other dungeons present in Wrath Classic, I'd recommend checking out my Dungeon Guide playlist, which you can find linked in the description below. If you found this video helpful, I'd highly encourage you to toss it a like, as that'll help other people find it as well.